Welcome to Conversations on the Future of Democracy, a series sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. I'm John Haskell, Director of the Kluge Center. Today, we are discussing a new book edited by Hal Brands and Francis Gavin, COVID-19 and World Order, The Future of Conflict, Competition, and Cooperation. We're joined by the two editors. Hal Brands is the current Kissinger Chair in International Relations and Foreign Policy at the Kluge Center and distinguishing, distinguished professor of global affairs at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He's a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and the author of several books on foreign policy. Frank Gavin is the Giovanni Agnelli Distinguished Professor and the inaugural director of the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at the Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His latest book, Nuclear Weapons and American Grand Strategy, was published in 2020. We're also joined by contributor Mar Margaret McMillan. In addition to being on the Scholars Advisory Council to the Librarian of Congress, Margaret is the Distinguished Visiting Historian at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's the Emeritus Professor of International History at Oxford and a Professor of History at the University of Toronto. Her latest book just out this fall is War, How Conflict Shaped Us. Welcome to you all. We're glad to have you here. I'm going to start with uh, Frank and Hal. You must have moved fast to put together a book like this with such a distinguished group of contributors. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I'll, I'll take a first crack at that, John. Uh, the, the idea for this volume actually came from the president of Johns Hopkins, uh, Ronald Daniels, who is a dynamo in pretty much every way, and, and called Frank and me at one point and said he had a terrific idea for how we should spend our summer uh, and that we should basically pull together a conference with stars like Margaret to discuss the implications of COVID world order and, th and then do a book on it. And so we basically had our marching orders, but it was uh, easy and fun to execute. Well, easy may be the wrong word. It was fun to execute because I think Frank and I had been talking for a long time about what we saw as a building crisis of world order even before COVID. There were a variety of strains on the international order from the resurgence of authoritarianism to the return of great power competition to the way that uh, populism was unsettling uh, political and economic bargains in countries around the world. And you put COVID on top of all this and it made it pretty clear that it was time to convene a group of really interesting people to start thinking about the implications of, of COVID, not just what it would do uh, in the next month or the next year, but how we might look back on it 20 years hence. And so we decided to put together a project that would draw on uh, all of the strengths of Johns Hopkins University. And so we have people from the School of Public Health who contributed great essays on that dimension of the crisis, uh, people who thought about international organizations as well as more traditional geopolitics, but then also bring in uh, wonderful contributors from outside the, the university, uh, people like uh, Corey Shockey or Thomas Wright or uh, Neil Ferguson or Margaret McMillan. Uh, and so in, in that sense, the book was really an opportunity for us to uh, bring together smart people to almost to help us organize our own thinking about the impacts that this tremendous crisis might have. Frank, what would you add? I mean, it's it's an as as Hal suggested, it's an eclectic group. People coming from a lot of different angles, from public service, from academia, journalism, etc. Yeah, what was really remarkable uh, was when Hal and I sat down and came up with a list. We expected pretty much half the people we asked to say no. Uh, it pretty much turned out just about everybody said yes. I think there might have been one person who said no and given how much pressure was on us to create the volume the amount of time that we gave to the authors was not particularly long it was uh, really a record turnaround and uh in addition to that there wasn't going to be a lot of time we would provide feedback we would get commentators to provide feedback and there wasn't going to be a lot of time to turn this all around and I think what was really striking was how eager people were to share their thoughts about uh, everything that was going on in the world. Uh, as Hal pointed out, the Kissinger Center, we've been thinking a lot about world order. This is obviously something that Henry Kissinger um, has thought about more than any, and it's one of the real themes that drives a lot of our work at the center. And this moment, I think, uh, served as a real constellation point for a lot of people to say, okay, 
there's this great uncertainty, there's this global crisis. As Hal said, uh, we had a sense that things were unsettled before, this is accelerating it. What does it all mean? And uh, what was, I think, really fascinating for Hal and I, Hal and I were having arguments about it before, we're having arguments and discussions afterwards. It was just really an incredible opportunity to get the smartest people that we know together to talk about these issues and learn from them. And I, I would add another point and to emphasize something that Hal said, uh, there's a lot of the traditional type of people who think about grand strategy and world order, but we have essays in there on the effects of world order, COVID and climate, or the food supply and food chains, which I had never really thought about. There's a terrific essay about from historians of medicine about how we know when pandemics end. So the other thing that I think was uh, really extraordinary about um, just wonderful for us was to bring in scholars from a variety of different disciplines uh, to help make us a lot smarter, which made it a lot of fun. Margaret, what charge were you given by these gentlemen? Well, I was asked to write a, a short essay on what history might have to say about the present crisis. And it, it's an interesting question. And I think what I've noticed in the past few months is historians are being called in because we have some perspective and we can sometimes formulate useful questions. And so I look back at other previous crises, at other pandemics, but also I spent quite a lot of time on the First World War because it's something I know a lot about. And I tried to figure out, of course, what we always have to do is figure out what is new and what isn't. But I tried to figure out where there might be parallels in the past with our present crisis. And I looked at things that helped to create the outbreak of the First World War, a sense of complacency, um, a dangerous tunnel vision on the part of leaders. And then at the end of the war, an unwillingness perhaps to learn some of the lessons from that catastrophe. And it seems to me that this, these are things we should be thinking about with the current pandemic. How did we get into this situation? Why in some countries did it become so bad? Why was there perhaps less international cooperation than there might've been? What went wrong? but also what went right. Why do certain societies tend to surmount and survive such challenges? And will we learn from it? Um, you know, historians don't like to predict the future, but I think at the moment we're all thinking about the future. And so I agree with, with both Hal and, and Frank. It was a very interesting mix of people, which doesn't often happen. Um, you know, quite often we're in our own boxes. I, you know, I meet historians and political scientists, both political scientists. And this was really good because we crossed all sorts of disciplinary boundaries. And, and I think we learned a lot from each other. I, I found it really fascinating. So thank you both. It's a great book. Now, uh, Margaret, I wanted to follow up on, on something that you touched on in your chapter, which is, uh, you know, the, the, everybody's, a lot of people, not just the contributors to this volume, are talking about how there's going to be great impact, for better or worse, uh, uh, in the response to COVID on the world order. Um, what was it like after, you know, the Spanish flu was, if anything, even maybe a more serious uh, health crisis. Um, did it have an impact on the world order of a similar magnitude that people are expecting? It doesn't seem to have done. And I think there may be two reasons for that. And one is that people at that time, when the pandemic, the flu pandemic broke out just at the end and, and in the early days after the First World War, people were much more used to uncertainty and much more used to the idea that there wasn't an answer for everything. I think we've lived in a world, particularly since 45, where we think there will always be a technological fix for something. And we have a pandemic, we get a virus, we get a, we get a vaccine immediately. And so I think in a curious way, people back then were more prepared for uncertainty. And of course, the influenza epidemic was not the only thing that carried people off. They were used to living in a world in which all sorts of illnesses and diseases, which we have now pretty much eliminated, did kill people. And finally, I think the First World War so overshadowed what else is happening that the influence epidemic, I mean, it's, it's, it, if you look at the literature, there are not that many mentions to it, about it. And there are not that many plays about it, not poems about it. Whereas I think COVID has had a profound impact on our societies, perhaps because we weren't prepared for uncertainty and we kept on thinking there must be a solution and quickly. In different ways, uh, when, you, when you go through the book, you notice that the contributors highlight the paradox that the liberal world order is largely responsible for the fact that the pandemic spread so fast, just as rising illiberalism is hampering the response. Um, 
Frank or Hal, uh, what's your take on that, that kind of paradox there? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think you rightly highlighted, I think, uh, one of the key tensions that emerged from the volume. Um, it's funny, when you bring together a great group like this, I think one of the things you want um, rather than answers are great questions. And there were four sort of big questions that emerged for me after reading them that I'm still wrestling with, which gets exactly to your tension that you're talking about. Uh, the first is, as you point out, uh, wither globalization, right? We've been in a period of intense globalization that uh, for several decades, which we recognize has generated extraordinary benefits, uh, very much aided by all sorts of new technologies. But we're also seeing at the same time that this globalization had uh, certain burdens and costs that we certainly weren't uh, uh, prepared to fully deal with. And I think that is one of the things that comes out, that global public health, like a lot of the sort of challenges that we're going to deal with, are products of globalization, but also um, can best be solved through globalization. There's all sorts of tensions and dilemmas there, and that's the first one. The second is that um, the global public health crisis highlighted, and this is an interesting debate that Hal and I have been having ever since, about what is actually shaping the international system. Uh, crises of these types, which are problems of the commons, which are transnational problems, which uh, tend to be not zero sum, are different than the sort of uh, return of great power politics problems that also appeared in uh, the volume. And this is, of course, if you read closely, the big debate about how to think about the US-China relationship that comes through very clearly in the volume. Uh, is the future of the international system going to be shaped more by these transnational global problems, or is it going to be a return to the sort of great power political dilemmas and issues that marked earlier uh, periods, there's going to be some kind of mix, um, which uh, obviously leads to this third question, which I mentioned, which is China. And then the fourth issue is what is the response to this, right? What are the institutional responses, the governance responses to deal with these? It's the other thing that I think comes through in the volume is that the institutions we created to deal with world order, some of which are post-World War II, some of them are post-World War I, some of them are post-89-91, but we're structured to deal with the realities of a different world, have really not done especially well to deal with this crisis, and highlights, I think, some of the inadequacies um, if we have to deal with future transnational crises like climate change. And uh, one of the th real robust discussions in the volume was, well, do we take the existing institutional architecture and, and reform it? Uh, do we create new institutions? Janice Stein had a terrific essay that talked about offsite, bringing it offsite, where you had institutions that were adaptable and manageable to very specific problems. Um, but all of that, I think, highlights the dilemma you 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 posed in your question, which is that uh, the world that we live in, which created all sorts of benefits, also created these problems, and we haven't our our thinking about governance and institutions conceptualizing this world hasn't caught up with, I think, the dilemmas and problems. Um, we've all, we've, we've basked in all the good things that it has produced for 30 years. And I think we're sort of coming to terms right now with some of the, 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 the burdens and difficulties. Hal or Margaret, would you like to add anything? I'll let Hal go. go. Sure, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I think the, the central issue that the pandemic revealed was that we had the reality of deep interdependence without the capacity or even the mindset to manage the problems that can flow from deep interdependence. And so one of the reasons the pandemic spread so quickly, obviously, is that global travel has become essentially commonplace in a way that would have been unimaginable in, in early eras, but there, earlier eras, but there were a variety of issues that rendered the liberal international order that had facilitated that globalization less capable of dealing with the pandemic. The, everything from international institutions, as Frank mentioned, that had become increasingly dysfunctional to a U.S.-China relationship that encouraged countries to take, a, the United States and China at least, to take a zero-sum rather than a positive-sum view of the crisis to the emergence of, a, uh, in many countries, a class of populist leaders who were uh, opposed, at least rhetorically, to globalization and thus less well prepared 
to engage in the sort of cooperative global management of, of crises that one would, would hope would emerge in a situation like this. And, and so I, I think that has been what is, is most striking about the crisis from the perspective of the liberal order. It was something that was facilitated in a way by the liberal order, but also revealed many of the deep strains that had emerged within that order. Yeah. Margaret? Um, I think what, yes, and what also has happened is that there were a number of problems and issues and tensions developing before the pandemic. And I think we were all aware of them, but perhaps not focused on them enough or, or, or not, not enough people were focused on them. And what the pandemic has done is overlapped with other crises. And that has possibly made it worse. I mean, the, the, the reservations about globalization, we, we understand the good sides and we're now becoming much more aware of, of the bad sides. The growing inequalities in society, the loss of faith um, in a number of countries is that people are having in their own leaders, the cynicism about um, those who lead you the lack of faith in institutions, and, and also institutions. I mean, Phil Bobbitt, in his uh, piece in the book, argued that some of the institutions, such as the US Constitution, are no longer adapted to dealing with the sorts of crises of the 21st century. And so if there's going to be a beneficial impact from, from the COVID-19, it will be that we're going to have to think about a lot of these things, because we recognize, I think, the challenges to our structures and, and the weaknesses in them. And the international organizations, which have served us actually very well since 45, we perhaps were forgetting why we needed them. And what COVID-19 has done again is remind us that we do need a degree of international cooperation. We do need an institutional arrangements so that we can cooperate internationally. And I think this may be a useful moment where we reflect on what needs to be fixed in our societies and, and what sort of institutions we need. And I have to hope that something good will come out of this. Having said that, how um, uh, or listening to Margaret's take, Margaret's take there, hopeful take, um, you wrote that the conventional wisdom uh, of the impact of COVID on the world order is quite pessimistic in general. Why is that? Well, I, I think much of the conventional wisdom, at least at the time we were writing the book, had emerged in the earliest weeks of the pandemic. Basically, the period between when this, the period when this went from being a problem for China to a profound crisis for the rest of the world. And during those first weeks, uh, it was, what was true in the market was true in everything. It, it wasn't clear where the bottom was. And so when, when people were writing about the impact of COVID in March and April, they were looking at uh, an America that seemed to be in, in disarray. There were concerns about whether democracies might prove uh, less well suited to handling the pandemic than uh, autocracies might. And so you saw a lot of writing in that vein that this might actually be the end of the American world order, the end of the, the liberal order. I think obviously the crisis has subjected the United States uh, and the system it led to profound stress. And we don't know exactly what the, the final damage will be yet. It depends a lot on how quickly we emerge from this and, and in what way. That said, I think one of the things that was becoming clear as we started putting together the, the volume was the point that Margaret just made, that there might actually be a number of opportunities to, to emerge from this uh, crisis as well. And so what, one of them clearly has been a much greater global skepticism toward the idea of Chinese power and Chinese leadership than there had been e even a year ago. In the United States and also in other countries, COVID accomplished what years of talking about the Chinese challenge in the South China Sea couldn't accomplish, which was to convince people in America and around the world that the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party might actually be a threat to their well-being and, and their livelihood. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. I think there is an, an opportunity to pursue what I would consider to be a, a smarter or a more strategic version of, of globalization. We often heard in the early days of the crisis this is the end of globalization. That's, that's clearly not true. And in fact, one of the things that's emerged from the crisis is how well global food chains have functioned under, under pressure, for instance. But I, I think what will happen as a result of this, or what I would like to see happen at least, is that countries won't go back into autarky, but they'll, they'll pay more attention to you know, what goods they actually have to produce themselves, what goods they can rely even on geopolitical rivals to produce, and then what goods they can't produce themselves but might be able to obtain through deeper economic integration with, say, other democracies or, or like-minded countries. And so I think what, what may ultimately emerge from all this is you will see the United States and other democracies 
uh, selectively decrease their economic uh, intertwining with, with China, but try to offset that by deepening their integration and their cooperation with countries that see the world the same way. And I think that would be a positive development. Frank, uh, how, to what extent is that dependent on American leadership uh, going forward in, 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 in terms of you know, the, the opportunities that both Margaret and Hal talked about and, and, the, and, a, and a much more positive scenario in terms of the impact on the, on the world order? That's uh, a great question. I actually think it's a pretty critical variable. And I, I think even though we're in the midst of the crisis, I think that we will likely look back um, decades from now and say that the absence of American leadership this year, or at least the erratic nature of that leadership on the pandemic, uh, probably made it worse than it had to be. Uh, and I think that um, getting to uh, Hal's excellent point, that's why this is such an interesting moment. Uh, one of the debates we had uh, throughout the conference and the volume was this a reordering moment, because typically reordering moments follow great power wars or a geopolitical collapse. We don't really have one of those. And so where will the incentive be? And I think as Margaret pointed out, it was sort of like a wake up call for a lot of people, a lot of, and, and hopefully, that wake up call uh, has highlighted that um, there does need to be more uh, appreciation and effort put into global, global governance on some of these key issues. Uh, but of course, the key variable is gonna be the US in many ways. And the US is, as we know, in the midst of this sort of internal debate and discussion about what its role in the world should be. I think a lot of us took for granted uh, that the commitment to sort of internationalism that was part of the U.S. profile through most of the Cold War and certainly through the post-Cold World was uh, something solid and that would continue. But I think we see not just in the success of Trump, but also throughout the political spectrum, um, there's certainly uh, over the past decade or so, uh, certainly since the war in the Middle East, an increasing skepticism about that American role. So I think there is an opportunity and a necessity for American engagement. But I also think there's little appetite for American engagement as it was conceived before this, meaning that there's an opportunity for some creativity, uh, for engaging with these new problems, but not necessarily returning to um, 2005 or 1995. And I, I think that political that set of political questions is going to be one we're going to see played out in the U.S. over the next few years uh, with uncertainty as to how it'll turn out, because there are strong elements of restraint um, oriented policies in both parties. I think a, not a small part of President Trump's popularity was because of his rejection of certain aspects of traditional uh, American internationalism. And so I think it's an open question. Um, I think there's a real opportunity, uh, but I think uh, it has to be cognizant of the domestic concern. And I think there's an opportunity for leadership to demonstrate how American leadership on the international scene connects directly to these domestic issues. Meaning that if America had shown greater leadership during this pandemic, there'd be less people dead. Right. I mean, that the, the economy, the global economy would be in far better shape. And you see, you know, with certain aspects, you look at how the Federal Reserve has performed, uh, for example, they've actually you know, for all the talk of American decline, American monetary power is is as critical as it ever was. And it's actually been, for the most part, uh, creative and important in keeping uh, this crisis from being worse. Uh, so it's unclear what the future holds for US leadership. I believe it's critical. I think this volume shows it's critical, but I also think it's critical that it not just be the same sort of leadership to sort of grab from the past, but sort of cognizant of the new challenges we face and the domestic re realities of a, an American citizenry that has some qualms about um, how America's engaged the world since the end of the Cold War. Margaret, what qualities of leadership uh, do you think are crucial? at this time. Well, what seems to have come out a lot, it seems to me, is that 
we've perhaps reached the end of a certain kind of political rhetoric. I mean, we still see a lot of it where leaders talk in slogans and they dumb down the message. They, they try and appeal to what they think people want to hear. I mean, that certainly was the case in the UK where, where I've been for the last few months. The, the government came up with three or four very simple commands, which in the end, I think people got fed up with. And what we may be seeing is a return to a, what I would call a more reason an adult type of political rhetoric on the part of leaders where they actually talk to their people and try and explain to them what it is that they're doing and try and explain that they don't know all the answers and i think we expect too much of our leaders we expect them to say, have a solution for everything and that may be breaking down i mean it seems to me the leaders that have really stood out and, and done well in managing crisis have been people like jacinta dern in, in new zealand um, angela merkel in germany who have talked very directly and have not pulled their punches and not pretended everything is going to be all right. And the public seem to be responding to that. And so we may be seeing a shift in styles of leadership. And I think we're seeing not possible, not yet a decline in populism, but certainly a challenge to populism because populist governments get into power promising everything. You know, they can fix everything. There won't be any price to pay. And I think what's becoming clear is they can't fix everything and there is a price, price to pay. And so we may be seeing, I think, a very important shift in a number of countries and possibly globally in the sort of expectations we have of our leaders and the expectations they have of us. And I think that could actually be a very good thing. Hal, what appointments should we be paying close attention to for President-elect Biden in terms of uh, impact on the direction and the, and the role of America in the post-COVID world? I think foreign policy types like myself often focus on uh, the three or four positions that we're all familiar with. Who's going to be the national security advisor, secretary of state, secretary of defense? And these are, these are all obviously crucial. But I think we need a broader view of key appointments in, in two respects. And so one, if you think about um, the issues that I think about, so in particular the U.S.-China relationship, the issues of who's running the Commerce Department and who's running the Treasury uh, department and who is the U.S. trade representative, those are going to be just as important as who is leading the Pentagon or or at Foggy Bottom because so many of the key issues in the U.S.-China relationship revolve around finance, technology, uh, and trade right now. And then the second uh, thing I would say is that it's important not just to think about the top level of appointments, but one or two levels below that, the assistant secretary, deputy assistant secretary, level, in part because that's where a lot of day-to-day -day policy gets made, and in part because um, that's where a lot of the day-to-day -day management of key relationships happens, but also because, you know, just as Frank was saying that the type of American leadership we're going to need isn't necessarily the type we had 10 or 20 years ago, that's where you'll start to see the generational turnover within the Democratic Party. And so at the top level, we'll probably have uh, a number of folks who played very distinguished and very important roles during the Obama uh, administration. A level or two below them is when we'll start to have uh, a younger generation of folks who may come in with a different set of ideas on the World Trade Organization or on China or on a variety of, of different issues. And so looking at how that kind of two-level dynamic plays out will be important as well. I was going to... Uh... As kind of a, a closing gambit, let's uh, give each of you an opportunity to uh, to, to tell President-elect Biden what he needs to do. If he were to call you, what would you tell him now with respect to COVID and the world order? Start with you, Frank. I would say that there's a real opportunity here that, again, with this crisis, uh, to rethink um, basically both how America engages the world, both in terms of its conceptual principles and its tools, and to be bold about that. I would also make it clear that there's a real opportunity here to connect these concerns of world order and foreign policy to domestic politics. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, Hal and I teach a course on the history of American foreign relations, and you look at the beginning, since the very beginning of the Republic, foreign policy was at the heart of all domestic debates. The modern political party system began with a debate over the Jay Treaty and our relationship uh, with Great Britain. And in the post-Cold War world, those two worlds have become divided. And increasingly, foreign policy, national security, 
international affairs has been seen as this sort of siloed off area separate from domestic politics, not really part and parcel of elections. And I think that hasn't been healthy. And I think one of the things I would tell the president to do is to say the reason, because obviously his domestic agenda is going to dominate for the first part of his administration as well as it should, but on any number of issues. And I would say here, not just pandemics and climate change, but things like um, social justice, inequality, all of those things in a globalized world, the connection between our relationship with China, the connection between uh, outcomes in people's day-to-day -day lives are intimately connected to how America engages and navigates the world. And a smart, effective, creative, forward-leaning foreign policy and engagement with the world will lead to much better outcomes for American citizens. And that case hasn't been made in a very long time. And I think there's a real opportunity to do so. Margaret? I think possibly three things. Um, one is recognize the importance of diplomacy. You know, that, that it's, I think, been neglected in a number of countries in the past two decades or so. And we need diplomats, we need experts, we need people who have made their careers studying other places and studying issues, and they can give us advice and give advice to our leaders. And I suppose the second thing I'd say, and I would say this as a Canadian because we believe in multilateralism, is fix and build your alliances. Work with those who are like you. Don't push them away. Um, work with them because even great powers, even a superpower, in the end needs friends and needs people to work with. And the third thing I think I'd say is take advantage of some of the blunders China has made in the past year or so. You know, we tend to think of China as dealing very successfully with the COVID crisis. But if you look at its foreign policy, and if you look indeed at its repression in China, I and mean, we're now becoming much more aware of what's happened to the Uyghur, um, that appalling story, but also the ways in which China has alienated neighbors, um, I think roughly pushed people away. I mean, they're now in a dispute with, with Australia, which is, I think, completely unnecessary. They've been threatening Canada um, in a number of ways. And I think the Chinese have actually lost a lot of, of, of authority in the world. I mean, they have been trying very hard to build up soft power, and it seems to me in the last year they, they, they've thrown, thrown a lot of that away. And I think this is an opportunity for the United States and like-minded states. Al? So I'll say two things. The first is uh, the Biden administration should keep in mind that it's going to get a huge soft power bounce simply by dint of its own existence on January 21st but that that soft power bounce is going to buy it about six months. Uh, and this is what we saw under the Obama administration, huge soft power bounce in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but then, you know, you have to start delivering it at some point. And, and so the, the Biden administration will have a lot of opportunity. There'll be a tremendous amount of global goodwill toward it from, from day one. Uh, but that is a temporary condition rather than a permanent condition if you don't get the policies right. The second thing I would say is that the United States should be thinking about a creative, ambitious, and generous program for global vaccine distribution. So uh, we've had big breakthroughs. It appears we have big breakthroughs on the vaccine development front, uh, vaccines that are likely to be far more effective than the versions that the Chinese are putting out. For, for instance, the Trump administration has distinguished itself by taking a you know, distinctively nationalistic approach to vaccine development, right? We're doing it for us, it's for us and for no one else. I think there's a big opportunity out there to think, think boldly about what a truly global vaccine distribution program would, would look like. That would be very costly. The United States would wanna do it in, in cooperation with like-minded countries. But I would see that as a wise investment in the future of American leadership. Well, Frank, Hal, and Margaret, thank you for joining us for the Conversations on the Future of Democracy series this fall. All of us at the library wish you the best.